The views and opinions expressed in this podcast by the host or the guest do not necessarily reflect the views of Paranormal Buzz Radio or its sponsors. Use of any materials produced by Paranormal Buzz Radio without express written consent is strictly prohibited. For information on everything Paranormal Buzz Radio has to offer, visit our website, paranormalbuzzradio.com. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Listener discretion is advised. Paranormal Buzz Radio is proud to present Girls vs. Ghosts, The Realm Walker with Kelly McCarvel, live only on Spreaker. Every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central, 6 Pacific. And as always, join us in our live interactive chat by going to Spreaker.com or downloading the Spreaker app for your devices. Kelly is a respected paranormal investigator and also a very gifted medium and brings a unique perspective into the paranormal field. Be sure to follow Kelly on all her social media at Facebook, Kelly McCarvel Moonspinner, Instagram and Twitter at Moonspinner76, and on the web at mysticalmoonspinner.com. Here's the show. Welcome, Kelly. I'm sorry, I was so intrigued by your love messages that I forgot to say you were live. <laughs> I'm like, I was like, oh shit, she's live, and I forgot to say, here's Kelly, here's the host of the show, and I'm now muting. Here you go. <laughs> Chris and have heard him on different shows and seen him out on investigations with me, but um, we're just going to take tonight to get to know him a little bit better. Matt says he can't hear me, Shay. Ooh, Shay. Ooh. Um, we got nothing. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right. Well, we're going to trust that Shay's fixing whatever's going on here, so... Oh, okay. I'm going to take that, that. That means you guys can hear me now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> All right. All right. Sounds like it's working. So we are going to go ahead and get going on this. So, Chris, tell us Hi. a little bit about yourself. Uh, yes, my name is Chris Nielsen. I've been a uh, paranormal investigator for, uh, I'd say, creeping up on a decade now. And, uh, yeah, so I started at a kind of younger age. I was about 16 when I first started actually uh, getting into all this. And uh, about 2011 or so, co found my first group with my dad. And then uh, recently, well, kind of recently, I guess it's been about, about three or four years now, I've been kind of starting to do a, a little bit more solo stuff. Uh, when I co-found AOP with my dad, it was you know kind of a family thing. I wanted to keep it like that. So I uh, started to kind of branch off a little bit and I ended up coming with the uh, kind of a rebranding if you will of uh, like the label Paranomatic because uh, it combines the, the paranormal stuff with the fact that I uh, was shaking things up and actually living pretty much a uh, fully nomadic lifestyle so 
uh, quite a few years there. I just kind of bounced around park to park and avoided this cold ass weather. <laughs> yeah, I was not the place to avoid cold weather. This is for sure. So one of the last places you that you were at was Spook Cave. Yeah. And I know that that was not your first year up there. This was uh, your third year, right? right? Right. Right. Okay. And you got to actually have an opportunity to do something there that hadn't been done before. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, um, this last year, 2019 season, was actually Spook Cave's first ever uh, Spook Cave uh, quote-unquote ghost hunts. Uh, because you can say paranormal investigation, but that for some reason doesn't sell quite as much as as the other phrase. Um, but yeah, I had a uh, after about um, I I pretty much knew right away going up there after I'd been living up there for a few months that so there was you know something kind of to the location, and I uh, I barked up a tree for three years, and they they kind of gave me the green light, so. I was able to not only take people into Spook Cave, but to a couple different uh, locations throughout the park and kind of get them involved in a uh, actual paranormal investigation. Um, so a lot of people for the uh, for the first time, which was a, uh, a really cool experience. It was my first uh, opportunity to actually host something like that all by right, myself. Right, right. Um, I think the dynamic of the investigation was really cool, too. It was uh, something you don't get with a lot of these, uh, you know, ghost hunts that, you know, can be put on other places. Because something like, you know, you go to our schoolhouse, you've got Ferrari, you know, you got outside. Uh, but that's pretty much the extent of it. It's Boot Cave. We had, like, 90 acres to work with. I took people down Lakeside, where the town of Beulah, Iowa, uh, existed until it was kind of leveled in a flash flood in the late 1800s. Um, we hung out in the game room for a while, and then we actually got to do uh, Spook Cave itself, which uh, has always been kind of a, a curious place um, for a lot of people. So, very cool experience. I'm, uh, I'm having to wait now, though, to find out if there's going to be a 2020 Spook Cave schedule. So, I'm done there as an employee, and the owners are actually selling. So... I have an in with the new owners. They seem interested, but they've got some ducks that get in a row before I start bombarding them with, hey, let me take people and look for ghosts kind of inquiry. So um, no word yet on whether or not Spook Cave uh, ghost events will be a 2020 thing, but uh, I'm optimistic. So what this means, guys, is if you want to be able to go on this investigation next year, when the new owners take over, you need to start bombarding Spook Cave. Just start sending them emails, making phone calls, and tell them, hey, we want to be able to come on a paranormal investigation again, so they'll have no choice but to bring Chris back. But those are Kelly's words, not mine, because they will hate me for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. You can tell them it was somebody else who told you to do it. Absolutely. So for anybody who doesn't know Spook Cave and kind of its history... I know you mentioned Beulah and a little bit about it, but can you tell us kind of a little bit the history of Beulah and also the cave? I mean, Spook Cave kind of makes you think it should be full of ghosts. Uh, yeah, so um, there are actually a few kind of different aspects that would, you know, lead to the uh, the haunting of Spurt, 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 Spurt Curve. Spurt, Spurt, it's Spurt Curve. Spurt Curve. Uh, no, so Spook <laughs> Cave um, is up in northeast Iowa. The, it's a you know, big, beautiful bluff country. It's gorgeous. Um, it's also... Used to be quite a bit of sacred land up there. So, um, Effigy Mountains is up in that area. Pikes Peak State Park um, is also up in that area. So, I feel like it's almost safe to assume we, being all kind of shitty white people, at some point leveled a few mounds in the Spook <laughs> Cave area itself. So, I, I feel like there's a lot of uh, native energy up there. There's also, um, I had mentioned Beulah. So, uh, kind of a Reader's Digest version on that history back uh, when everybody was starting to move westward in the early 1800s. Uh, a lot of crossing occurred in Iowa. And with that coming of people also came their technology, like especially the railroad in particular. So with the single railroad going in, they eventually added a couple tracks to the area, and long story short, there had to be a switch put in, and that was, I want to say, mid-1800s in there somewhere. So, uh, the switch got put in, but it, you know, was 
middle 1800s, so there wasn't those electronic switches. They had to have somebody physically there to control the switch while you put one person there. Uh, naturally, other people start showing up, and eventually it, it grew into this kind of budding railroad town, uh, Beulah, Iowa. And this was actually kind of a growing population. They had a, a general store. They had a post office. And uh, they were actually kind of prospering in the area until about 1896 uh, when a 20-foot wall of water kind of came in and leveled the town. Uh, being optimistic people, they rebuilt, and there was a, <laughs> a second flood in 1816, and that uh, that was kind of one of those, you know, flooded twice, which probably uh, get out they of here kind of after things. a couple yeah, times. They, 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 yeah. Well, flood me know. once, shame on nature, flood me twice, uh-huh. you know, get the hell out of you. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That, that was bad. Horrible. That was a that bad was joke. horrible. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, yeah, that was uh, a <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beulah's tragic history in a nutshell. And when, you know, you establish a town, they've obviously got to get some information, including your general coordinates, uh, longitude and latitude specifically. So... Thankfully, when Google did its thing where it kind of mapped the planet, uh, it had the information for Beulah, Iowa to plug in. And when you go onto Google Maps and check, uh, that pin actually drops not only in the Spook Cave campground, but pretty much right where Two Acre Lake is now. Which is just irony. I mean, it's almost like... Yeah, it's just No, the ironic ironic part is people swim in there. (laughs) Oh, this too. Yeah. But, you know, 19 people drowned there. So let's put a lake where people go swim and play and have fun in the water and it's just... Well, we yeah. a lot of I mean, I don't think anybody knew when they put the no, lake there, but... I don't think anybody like today knows that they're like swimming around where town used to be, which is Well, we should start fun. rumors that people... Spook Cave's get, haunted? Well, that too. <laughs> but we should start rumors like if you swim out in the lake, people grab your ankles and stuff like that. People would eat that up. Right? And they'd also never let me back. <laughs> Okay, fine, we won't start rumors. We'll just go with the real things that happen out there. So I've had, um, I've been on a lot of investigations, and I was actually lucky enough to go on a couple of these investigations with him. And the the Beulah area was neat, the game room was neat, but my absolute favorite part of the investigation is the cave. I mean, how often do you get to go paranormal investigating in a flooded cave? Yeah, the cave is really, really cool. Um so aside from being like just geologically kind of a cool thing, if you're a appreciator of caves or speleology, um, yeah, the cave is very cool. It's a relatively young cave, uh, neat stuff in there. And it, from a paranormal aspect, it's even cooler because that is almost an entirely limestone cave, and that it has its own natural spring that runs out of the back that. Is essentially supplying energy because it's a you know pretty accepted idea that running water produces its own uh, EMF to a to a certain degree. So it it just kind of makes sense that would be a hot spot. And interacting with the spirits back there, um, having worked there for three years prior, I definitely encountered a uh, a few of them. So I, I I knew there was something to it, and. Yeah, to interact with them, they're just there because they like it. It's peaceful. It's quiet. Um, in the grand scheme of things, there's not a whole lot of people, you know, coming and going throughout right. the entire day of the year. They've got half the year to just kind of relax and have their space. It, it's it's definitely an interesting place. I mean, um, I knew that that you had said because you went in all the time for the tours and everything that you would hear that you would see people in there and that you'd hear them talking, but I guess I didn't I didn't expect it to be so prevalent when I went in there. I thought maybe we'd hear just this little whisper of this or that or the other thing, but it's like constant chatter. It's You can hear them talking. You can tell if it's a male or a female, if it's young, if it's old. It, it, it is, and it's just like Becca just, um, oh no, EMF reading. Um, I was thinking it was EVP. It's like a water EVP, which is just, it's phenomenal. Oh, yeah, which is actually a thing, and yeah. sometimes you have to, I mean, people have been kind of doing water EVPs for quite a long time, yeah. and that's like the perfect spot for it, because oh, it's absolutely. probably from every direction, including on top of the a lot of times. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so the cave is, is uh, cool. It stays at comp- uh, constant temperature of 42 47. 47. The water temperature is 42. Ah, see. Oh, well, there you go. I was almost right, sort of, kind of. Um, so it's chilly in there. And then it does drip, especially if it's been, like, rainy. And so this last season was super rainy. And one of the times I was in there, it was kind of raining in there. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm being distracted by Shay. <laughs> um, I was saying something. <laughs> it was cold in the cave. It was cold in the cave. And, yeah, it's really wet in there. Um, so... I will actually go to a question that we had. Um, Rebecca was asking if we got any EMF readings off the water. Uh, not the water directly, but there are uh, there are lights throughout the cave. And as I was effectively able to show people, some of those lights are uh, the higher up they are. The ones close to the water are very safe. Uh, the ones in the drier spots in the cave... Um, there was one light that was not, I'm guessing, properly insulated or something like that. Uh, anyways, we were getting EMF spikes underneath that, and I had to be the, uh, the kind of asshole that showed them that uh, when that would when that occurred. So that was kind of a fun interaction. We uh, were coming back from this one part of the cave, and this lady had her. I brought her own EMF detector with her. And it was it was pretty quiet throughout the entire time until we pull up directly under this light, and of course it's and she's all excited, it's like oh my god, there's someone sitting next to me. And for the next like five minutes, I pull and push them underneath the light, making it light up and turn off. And it took people a little too long to figure out what was going on. Yeah, yeah, it was it was one of those experiences like oh that's really cool, but it dawned on me, and I realized you were moving the boat back and forth. I'm like oh we're gonna break their hearts, but yeah no. Um, so Darren wanted to know, do you have any new experiments you're working on? Uh, I'm playing with a concept, waiting to turn it into an actual experiment. So the problem with this one is that it's going to require a pretty well-controlled location and a lot of time. Uh, so the, uh, I feel like it's pretty safe to say that, uh, we as people and spirits are made up of energy. And as everybody knows, there's different wavelengths of that energy. And I've been playing with the idea of taking a location and basically basically pumping it full of a certain frequency. So um, I have a location, I'll do an investigation in there as kind of a control and use the a uh, number of uh, findings, so to speak, as kind of a as a measurement. So on this night, I got uh, you know one picture and a couple EVPs and a few intelligent responses via ITC device, and that will kind of be my control. Now we'll give it a day or two, and then say for example, I'll go in, I'll start playing a just a bunch of alpha waves throughout the location. And then try the investigation again. Then try going into there again after a day or two with beta, then delta, then theta, then gamma waves. And basically kind of repeating that over and over again to see if that change in frequency will actually change the paranormal activity in the location. That's pretty cool. It's all science stuff. I was going to say, I just said a bunch of stuff that went right over your, uh, right over your head there. Yeah, you know, it's all science stuff. I just want you to hand me the thing and say, here, push this button, and and that's how we make it work. Um, so looking at some questions in chat, trying to keep up with everything. Um, Cynthia asked a question that we're going to skip because we don't want to have to start a fight. Um, <laughs> what is Chris Nielsen's favorite Michael Jackson song? <laughs> I'm assuming that's from Cynthia, and it sounds like she's trying to be starting something. Ah, oh, you guys are pathetic. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, so um, we have done quite a few investigations together lately, and I know that one of the things that we've done 
is the Estes method, and we've had a lot of good luck with that. Do you want to kind of talk a little bit to that? Uh, yeah, so Estes method was uh, developed by a group out of Estes Park, Colorado, and basically it revolves around the use of ITC devices. So when you use an ITC device, um, whether it's the Spirit Box, a Spiritus, Necrophonic, um, any of those types of devices there's always this kind of back of your mind mental bias that occurs. Uh, it's a fun effect called pareidolia. So as smart as our brains are, sometimes they can be quite stupid and they actually have to make sense of things, which is absolutely ludicrous. Um, and I, uh, the best thing I can come up with is that there's an example in my mind where we were doing, uh, you and I, actually it was me and you, uh, we were with Transcendent Paranormal Society. We were at the old... Uh, old 52 building in Lancaster, Wisconsin. And we had one of these devices out when we were there with a bunch of former employees because uh, they had worked there for years. It was about to be torn down. And we were able to give them that kind of like last minute closure, like they weren't uh, collectively insane. So I had a, I want to say it was Spiritus running in a room at one point. And it was uh, myself, Kelly, and one of the former employees and a word came out that all three of us heard something different. So the former employee actually heard the word forms, which uh, would make a bit of sense with the situation because we were actually in her office where she spent a lot of the day filling out forms. I heard dorms, uh, like dormitories, where you know it's just a collection of rooms, which is what this building uh, basically was, and then Kelly heard something different that neither of us remember what yeah, I don't what remember. she thought she heard. But anyways, we all had kind of heard something separate based off of our own little uh, back of the mind mental biases. And Estes Method kind of removes that from the equation. So what you'll do is you'll take your ITC device, and you will basically hook it up to a pair of sound-canceling headphones, and you will put them on a person who's just basically sitting there listening and they're saying whatever words they hear. Now, they can't hear what the question being asked is, so they're giving the most unbiased version of what the response could be. Um, we've actually had a lot of luck with that recently. We've um, had a ton of luck with that I'm going to get you some clicks here real quick. After this, stay tuned for the rest of the podcast, but after this, uh, stop by Kelly's page and check out what we did at uh, Cambry House. It would have been two, two weekends ago now? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's We've a, been from the 8th of November. Yeah, uh, and it's a, it's a good time. The, uh, the entire live stream was, of course, fantastic as always, but then we got upstairs and they gave me a pair of headphones and got a lot of just, according to them, immediate responses of, you know, and not only immediate responses, but intelligent responses. And a little kid played with my uh, my little drawstring on my hoodie. Yeah, it was one of the most consistent, accurate responses that we've had, and I think that was the thing. the The live session went, I think, almost two hours, but it's because every time I thought about turning it off, we'd get another answer and another answer, and it's like this is too good to not not continue to air this. I mean, there was one point that, um, so anybody who doesn't know Cambry House, Rebecca Williamson owns it. And then Chad Deary has a lot to do with that as well. And Chad hadn't been, Becca had been on the on the live feed and had been commenting and stuff, but Chad had not. And all of a sudden he got into chat and I had said to the spirits, I said, hey, Chad just came in. Can you say hello to Chad? And it wasn't long at all. And Chris gets Deary. And his brain went to like, cow dairy moo you know um and then another second later he gets chad and you could see the realization come across his face like oh oh so yeah that that was pretty cool and i think he did actually take the headphones off at that point so we could tell you yeah it was pretty cool um but yeah the whole video is out there and then um we actually well we (laughs) i say we like i had anything to do with it chris actually took it and cut out this one little spot because as we're out there, we were out there with Mama Pat and my friend Stephanie Corlett was with us too. And so Chris was sitting doing the Estes method and Stephanie was an entire room away from him. She was sitting in another room 
And she comes flying out of that other room. She's like, did you just see that the string on his hoodie swing? And he had, he didn't realize that's what he'd seen. But when you go back and you watch the video, it's, it's very, very clear that something just kind of took that string and went boink and kind of flopped it. Um, and we think it has a lot to do with there's a, there's a little girl of spirit that's up there on the second floor of the Cambry house that loves to play with a pendulum. She'll just, she'll swing it like crazy. So, um, we almost wonder if it isn't maybe her. So we're going to have to go back out and ask the questions now that we know what right. happened and see who that was. But I'm willing to bet it was Eglatine or however you say her crazy little name. I say Eggy now. Eggy. Eggy. Yeah. Well, that's what she said. She was, she, she was called. Which when she first told me that, I'm like, that is the weirdest name, but okay. All right. So, um, so I see Darren's question, but I kind of want to go backwards a little bit here and just ask, because I like this story. How did you get into the paranormal in the first place? Did you have an experience that started that? I mean, I know the answer to that. I know the answer to this. I'm, but this isn't, this teeter song like an awkward, like, I, okay. Because you know all the answers, so I'm not feeling like I'm actually giving you information. So anybody who is new to listening to this or doesn't know myself or Chris very well, Chris is one of my very best friends, and we investigate all the time, and there's not a lot that I don't know about this man. So it is a little weird to be asking him questions that I do completely know the answer of, but, you know, I am aware that not everybody knows him. So I'm going to ask the questions anyways and play along, goddammit. I'm doing my best. Just play along. Pretend I don't know. And I'm old. I may have forgotten. Uh, so, yes, I uh, <laughs> I did have an experience as a child. No way! I did! Oh my god, can you tell me about it? I can't, actually. Oh. They told me I can't anymore. Oh. Uh, no, so... Um, Smart. Uh, well, I was about... I was like eight at the time. And... To this day, I, I've made a habit of traveling the country, so I've been, my radius right now is like Arizona to Pennsylvania, countless locations, countless investigations, and to this day, uh, my grandparents' house growing up is actually still one of the most home places I've, uh, I've ever been, so uh, there was one morning, so my dad worked for Buchanan County Sheriff's Department for about 20 years. So growing up, his schedule was everywhere, uh, which meant when I went to visit on the weekends, my schedule was everywhere. And there was one morning he had uh, dropped me off to my grandparents' house. And, and, of course, we had to have a little pep talk to spazzy little eight-year-old Chris, like, hey, don't be a little <laughs> shit. Go lay on the couch and don't wake Those up. Those were grandpa. probably your exact words that you heard, too. Don't be a little shit. Nah, my dad was nice to me growing up. Oh. Um... So, anyways, uh, he was basically, yeah, go lay down on the couch. Uh, and it was, I think, like five in the morning or something like that. So, uh, just an absolutely unholy hour. So, nobody was up yet. He's like, go lay on the couch. You don't have to go to sleep. You know, whatever. Just uh, hang out till grandma and grandpa wake up. So, I'm laying on the couch. And going into their house, you can go in the front door. You can either go upstairs that are uh, kind of parallel to this hallway that goes further into the house. Or you can take an immediate right, which is where I was at, you know, in the living room. So I'm, you know, I'm laying there and I'm tossing, I'm turning because I'm a little high strung eight year old Chris. And at one point I roll <laughs> over and on the foot of the stairs, there's just this little boy looking at me like as, as clearly as I'm seeing this computer screen right now. And he's just, you know looking at me and of course you know this is absolutely terrifying to a younger version of myself so I did the universal protection of the 8 year old and I threw the blanket over my head it's like a force field it does you're safe under there of course so, I'm hiding under there for what probably was only about 5 minutes but you know felt like an attorney and basically with everybody's you know, ghost stories it's always very quick it's very like I saw it I turned to double take and it was gone well unfortunately for me at the time this was well, not the case, because this little boy is just still just he's sitting there, and he's looking at me. So I, you know, threw the blankets over my head, and for the longest time, I I kind of dismissed it. I didn't, I mean, I knew it had happened, but I was trying to ignore it, because I was kind of weird back in the day, apparently, and I didn't want to, you know, be giving my parents too much to have me committed. <laughs> 
And like I said, it kind of gone away. I, and the, the, the fascination had always kind of stuck with me. So uh, fast forward, and I'm like, I'll say 15, 16, and my library is doing a kind of a big book sale, and I got my hands on a bunch of Hans Holzer books, and the fascination just kind of took off from there, and I, I started researching, studying, going out and actually looking for these things, and it was one of those kind of cool experiences where I, I got a little bit of, of closure a few years on, so I was probably 18, 19 or so, I'm visiting my grandparents one day, uh, same house, and they're watching my, at the time, two or three year old cousin Paige. And she's, you know, I'm on the bunk couch around the other. She's just sitting down in between them, kind of, you know, doodling or something, drawing in a book. And we've been having a conversation for a good half hour or so now. And she's completely enthralled with what she's doing when she just stops. And she sets down her little book and she stands up in between them. And she actually pointed out the door to those stairs and just asked everybody in the room, you know, what's his name? That is craziness, and that's the type of validation that, how do you... Oh, I lost you, my shit. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy when you get something like that, and I mean, she obviously at that age had no clue, mm-hmm. and it's way far apart from when it happened to you, so that's that's awesome validation like that. That's when you want to have a camera running all the time, though, so you can catch that crap on camera. Anyways. All right, so, Darren had a question, and this question cracks me up. What is the one object in the world that you would never want to be haunted? I'm told there's a big red button in the White House that if you push it, all nuclear missiles will go off. I would assume something like like something like that could cause like massive damage, like to like the world as a whole, uh, or. I so yeah, it doesn't get a whole lot worse than that. Probably either that or, like, my sexy bag. Your sexy bag? You have to explain that now, because so, now that just sounds really wrong. Or, or, I can leave it with no context. And we make everybody want No, it's so my sexy bag. I've got this red leather suitcase that I travel with everywhere, and it's part of my kind of display uh, when I go to conventions and expos, that sort of thing. And my... A uh, friend of mine, Mark, uh, he's actually got a tubby tattoo. He uh, he's getting into pinstriping right now. And if you don't mind me making a quick plug, he's trying to develop a YouTube channel. So if you awesome. if you look up pinstriping by Doc, you can see some of his work. Uh, by he actually, Doc, yeah, okay. Doc, uh, D O C. A uh, actually kind of put in like like the Paranomad, and it's it's very, it's it's a sexy bag. It is kind of a sexy bag. The guy's got an, an amazing amount of talent. Very, very much so. All right. Um, sexy bag. I've got yeah. a sexy bag. Darren, that could have yep. been so bad if we'd have just left it there, right? All right. So what is your funniest thing that's ever happened to you out on an investigation? I'm getting asked questions for years, and I don't know if I've ever been asked this Yeah, I tried to th- think of some questions that you haven't been asked before. Dead silence. This is a great radio show when there's dead silence. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, honestly, there's just such a, like, a high like volume of like 2.30, 3 a.m. like delirium kind of things. But the problem is with 2.30, 3 a.m. kind of delirium kind of moments, you forget them. Um, I can what, tell you one. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I obviously haven't been with him for all his investigations, but I can tell you one that Cynthia will verify. Oh, you asked with this one in mind, didn't you? Well, it was there in case you didn't come up with an answer. Yeah, go ahead, share. What? Okay, so this story's at my expense, and for some reason she keeps making me be the one to tell it. Because it's the best. <laughs> so, very recently, <clears throat> I, uh... We had the privilege and opportunity to go investigate with Raven Rose Paranormal out of Storm Lake, Iowa, at a place called the Shaler Haunted House, which is a 
very cool location. Uh, it's actually like a haunted attraction, like the the uh, October, like people jump out, Bleh, scary kind of thing. And we had gone back in uh, August. It's an April. actual haunted location as yeah. well, though. It's an old popcorn factory. So back in April, we kind of went into like a uh, essentially like a baseline investigation, and then we did follow up here the second of November. Yeah, okay. uh, something like that. On the second of November, after their actual like scaring the crap out of people season ended, and the the place had been shut down. We're in there. We're doing our thing. I'm in full investigation mode, which I feel like is an important note on this because there's a certain level of focus <laughs> that comes with it. <laughs> the story ends with me jumping without the use of my knees. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the uh, maze section of the haunted house now. And there, to get through there, there's like a room here. There's a room here, a bunch of maze stuff in between. You got to find your way out through like a little slick in the wall. And we're in one of the rooms. And one of the doors just opens a little bit and slams shut. So naturally... This has the interest of everybody is who is in there doing a paranormal investigation. So, I am locked on this door. Absolutely, like, nothing else in the world exists right now aside from this door. Until that door flies open, there is a car horn attached to a drill and a very bright light. <laughs> and I moved back about three feet. <laughs> I think he'd have gone farther than the three feet, but there was a wall behind him because we hear this thump behind me. And yeah, I didn't get to see it, but Cynthia and another gal were watching him and said he went straight up and into the wall. It was pretty amazing. All right. So what was your scariest experience ever? What a cliche. Kelly McCarville here with the hard hitting questions. You know, bite me, bite me. Answer the damn question. Uh, so, uh, that was probably one of <laughs> two things. Um, the first one being, like, an immediate jump scare, and honestly, it was probably just as bad as the the horn and the light. Uh, it, was my, it was my one of our first uh, house calls, so to speak. It was for a local business in Scales Mountain, Illinois. And in the basement of this saloon, there... Basically, whoever was down there was just, he was just a bit of a dick. And he, he liked the basement. That was his space. And so naturally, I'm down there by myself. And at one point, shit just starts going absolutely bazonkers. Uh, there's, uh, I had a cap thrown in my head. There was banging on heating vents in very close proximity to me. And all this time, I'm losing, like, bits of equipment and stuff. Like, not losing them per se, but like the, the batteries getting tapped out very quickly. So after this banging on the heating vents and everything, I'm down there with just an audio recorder. So I've got my dad and my brother on the radio who are like three floors above me, like, hey, uh, shit, shit, shit's banging down here, shit's happening. Uh, can you, uh, I don't have any cameras. I need, I need like somebody else in the camera. So my dad, my dad sends my brother down and being the brave soul that he is, my brother throws <laughs> a camera at me. And then runs back up the stairs. So I'm now alone with a full-spectrum camera and audio recorder, and I'm filming a little bit. And then that camera dies on me. So I'm now in there, in the dark, with this guy who's been just rocking my world for, like, the last half hour or so. It was a good time. <laughs> so... I'm down. One of the claims was a CO2 tank exploded, which has plenty of real world implications, but I was curious nonetheless. So I went over and I'm talking next to the CO2 tank, like, hey, you're you know, doing all these crazy things. You're, they said you made this explode. And for the second time in my paranormal investigation <laughs> career, so to speak, I, I uttered a phrase that would almost immediately come back to bite me in the ass. So I. I I said the phrase, well, that's all well and good, but I'm still down here. Uh, can you do something to impress me? And no sooner than I said that, I could see, it was a dim light, but I could see into the basement far enough to see that there's this dolly, this two-hand push cart. And 
it was like somebody had just taken it by the handles and like flipped it on its axis, like handles straight to the ground, loud noise, shit in pants. It was <laughs> uh, probably my most like immediately jarring kind of experience. So naturally, I'm in full panic mode. My hands aren't staying still for anything, and I'm fumbling for my walkie-talkie on my belt. And before I can even get a hold of it, my dad, and my brother, who apparently had heard it two or three floors up. What the fuck did you just do? <laughs> and I'm in an emotional state right now. I need sympathy. They're that so was, very supportive. <laughs> that would be fair. I'm prone to shenanigans. This is true. Uh, yeah, that was probably the most like immediately jarring. I think the most long-term kind of scary experience was my little stint I did in Edinburgh. I was just going to ask you about that. Uh, yeah, so um, in 2013... Uh, before Edinburgh got its, you know, big break and everybody knows about it now. Uh, I had a fit of young and stupid and I was like, hey, I'm going to make a movie. Well, what can I make this movie be about? Uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do an investigation. Uh, I'm going to do an investigation alone. And I'm going to do it for five days at the Edinburgh Manor, which hindsight being 2020 was just kind of stupid. I came out a, uh, a little weird, a little rattled and, I think that's kind of what's actually stuck with me the most, um, because that immediate, like, that, you know, poltergeist type of activity is always like, holy crap, that's terrifying in the moment. Uh, But to this day, I'm still kind of weird about Edinburgh. It's one of my favorite locations, don't get me wrong, but there's always this weird little bit of apprehension to the place now, too. So I noticed my big thing when I was in there I went through a few phases. One of them was being just absolutely terrified of the silence because I knew something was going to happen next. Something was going to happen next. I just, I didn't know when. So it left me in this really deep state of paranoia. So it's almost like the anxiety was worse than when something was actually happening. Yeah. And it, it went from that to this, this, you know, just being absolutely jaded by all of it, which is terrible content for a documentary. I uh, I got one clip in particular in mind where uh, you know I'm film trying to film for a documentary, so I've got cameras a little bit of everywhere, uh, especially on me. And at one point, I've got a camera set up on a table, and it's filming me watching static. Uh, that had to be riveting. Oh, fantastic stuff! I was like <laughs> hoping to get like little tidbits here and there, but I'm also like like I said, it was constant stuff. So like to actually get like reactions was kind of an important thing. I'm just giving you shit. I'm just thinking about how when you sit and you watch hours and hours and hours of footage. And it's a lot so of it was boring. me. And I was yeah. like, yeah. Uh, watch so, him drooling as he's watching footage. Sorry, I, don't have, I don't be drooling on that one, but I do have one where I was at the Franklin hotel and I was filming the bedroom I was in. And at one point you see me actually roll over and like wipe my mouth. <laughs> Which is fantastic. Hot. <laughs> it was it was it was Chris Nielsen at his sexiest. <laughs> Anyways, there's this camera on me and I hear it's it's caught on the camera's audio, but there's this definite baby crying. And instead of you know, jumping up being excited like, Oh my gosh, paranormal activity, I'm gonna go check it out. I just like I stopped mid like scroll with the the mouse I was using at the time. I looked up at the camera and went Oh, baby's crying again. Then I went back to what I was doing. <laughs> uh, so that was that's probably one of the more long term kind of left me rattled kind of scary experiences. It's probably it's probably why I drink as much as I do. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> I don't think I could stay out there for that long of a period of time. Nobody should. It, that's well, that's the point. Learn from me. <laughs> Learn from you, young and stupid. All right. All right, Darren had a question, and I think I missed it, and then I scrolled back and found it, so let me find it again. All right. So when you go into a regular house haunting, you search up the history of the house and the land and stuff. So how different is a log cabin haunting when you know the materials are from the earth? Do you think it could be a more aggressive atmosphere? Um, and if you mean, like, attitude aggressive, I feel like that's just directly involved with the spirits involved. Like, like that's more the direct spirits involved. I don't think, I mean, you're going to have Grandma Edith, who's haunting the house. I don't think she's going to naturally be more quick to try to fight you in the dark just because 
a house or servant to this. But yeah, I feel like there's a there's energy and spirit and everything. And I feel like if your house is made of you know a stone floor and the the logs were you know actually at one point a a tree that hasn't been processed, I feel like that's going to be very prone to to um, not just holding that kind of spirit, but I feel like that's also going to be an environment where, uh, you know, maybe resident, uh, like human spirits going to be a little bit more keen to, uh, to kind of hang out. So I, I feel like there's potential there. Um, but I, I also don't have any like experience to prove that that's the case. You know, we should find a log cabin and investigate it. I like that it. though, because that, is a good. That's an interesting question, there, and it definitely is because I hadn't really thought about that aspect of it before. But I mean, if you can take an object into the house and change the energy of a house, and the entire house itself would it would make so like um, I guess that almost teeters on like so people be telling me like I've got this, these things going on in my house, yeah, 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 and it always seems like I've got like a rough limestone basement, I was a just dirt say, floor. Yeah. I was, it's like ooh, that's a. Uh, you, you like you now have a bit more of my interest. Well, and if you took limestone from an area and went and you know, let's say for some weird reason we went and we mined limestone out of Spook Cave and decided to build. There's a house actually out. a limestone quarry like just up the road from Spook Cave. Really? They have to close the tours on occasion when they're blasting. Well, that's not terrifying at all. Okay, I didn't need to know that. I'm never going back in the cave. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kevin, three sixty. What's that? Um, Cabin 360 is a place in Virginia, I think, that Shay just went to. I honestly don't know a ton about it, but it's a cabin. Well, we're going to learn more about that. It's a ways away from here, but, I mean, we are not I'm a always down for a road, road trip. trip. Jinx, you owe me some Jeez. coke. Yeah. Um... So on the on the concept of like aggressive spirits, what kind of are your views on negative spirits? And dare I throw out the D word? <laughs> the demons. Demons. Um. So when it, like, I'm gonna just address demons really quickly, just because it's the most overused word in the paranormal vernacular nowadays. Um. Do they exist? I don't know. I've never run into one. And honestly, if there is a energy out there made of pure evil, I feel like they got better things to do than to, you know, kind of tug on my bed sheets. Yes, Jamie, just keep going. But no, I feel like with general human interaction, we're bound to meet an asshole or two in our day. Uh, I mean, it's, it stands to reason those people are going to retain that assholey personality once they transition. I mean, spirits aren't really any different than us, minus the fact they ditched the meat suit, so... Right. It would make sense that on occasion there's going to be an asshole. Well, I know, like, so we've had several talks that we do together, and especially, like, the panels at the Expo we just did this last weekend, and there's a question that you asked that I love, because it's so... It puts into perspective for people the reality of demons. You want to share the question you asked? Or? Oh, it's the one that requires audience participation. Yes. So it's going to lose its effect via podcast. Um, but it's honestly it's something that I've been doing on pretty much every speaking event I've been a part of for a little while now. And it's basically like, okay, so this demon, this non-human entity of just concentrated evil um, in a collection of people, you know, raise your hand if you've met something like this. And generally speaking, no one's hand goes up. And I'll be like, okay, now... Um, I want everybody in this room to raise their hand if they've met a 100% genuine bona fide asshole and there isn't a single person whose hand stays down and I feel like that just kind of sums it all up is they're not demons, they're just dicks. It's <laughs> just a good visualization for people to see that how many times do we run into somebody that's just demon? Demons? Yeah. Oh, I thought Roland had jumped in there. Thank you, Darren. Filling in for him. <laughs> Yeah, we get asked about demons all the time. That's it's never fun. So, all right, let's talk about your woo woo a little bit. 
Yeah. I didn't realize it was that kind of podcast. Well, you know, it is Mark explicit. Oh, that's fair. So, um, so I know that um, for a long time when we went out on investigations, you were the more scientific, and I was the more woo-woo one, but you've been kind of having some experiences lately. I'm getting a little woo-woo, yeah. Um, that sounds so wrong. <laughs> or right. Um, it's, it's been a recent... I guess not super recent development because I feel like there's always been something kind of there. So my my view on the whole thing is that there's obviously some people that are naturally more inclined to it, more talented at it. But I like to think that everybody is born with that kind of sixth sense, and as we you know grow up, the uh, that need to put rational filters on everything and these things don't exist, and you know all that stuff, y- y- you lose that over time and yeah I think just recently I've been over the last I don't know I'd hazard to say last three, two or three years all those filters have been kind of gradually coming off and this last year has just been yeah weird for me <laughs> um so not only am I getting the uh, like, kind of that gut instincts, like, you know, there's someone here kind of thing. I'm not just getting, oh, that person's upset or happy or that's a boy, that's a girl. Um, I'm, I'm seeing them, <laughs> which is absolutely bizarre to me. Um, and I think it's it's because I've been hanging out with, like, people like Kelly and something else you want, and they're starting to rub <laughs> off on me. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, that's, uh, I guess I don't even know how to really describe it all. It's been, it's it's been interesting. Um, I started really acknowledging it back 2000, I want to say 17. Uh, my dad and I were on this, you know, big road trip from here to Gettysburg, Lawrence, Kansas, and back. At one point, uh, we're driving through the middle of nowhere, Kansas, and I just felt weird, like, oh, something something strange has happened here. And I happened to pass by a mile marker where there was, like, the name of the street or something, looked it up, and it was like, well, something weird had happened there. It was a battle that predated the Civil War in the area. Um, earlier on that trip, we were... Uh, and this is just a cool location for any investigators out there looking for a cool place. A Redmond Acre Farm in Charlottesville, Indiana. A very cool place, funky history, funky story. And anyways, we're getting our tour of the place. And this, you know, ladies like this happened here, this happened here. And I would, we get to the end, I was like, okay, it's cool. What a, like, we get down into the basement. And she's like, well, there isn't a basement. And I'm like, no, there's there's something underneath of us. There's, there's something going on below, and if you can't let me into the basement, that's cool. Just don't bullshit me and tell me there's not a basement, because there's definitely something underneath of us. And she's like, there's there's not a basement here. I mean, there's a root cellar off, you know, ways that way or something like that. But, you know, there's no basement to this house. And I did some more looking up into the actual town of Charlottesville, Indiana, not just the location itself, but... Uh, a big part of that town was essentially a was leveled native burial ground. Oh, wow. And, and that was a weird combination of that, and I had a... Uh, I'm also prone to going places when I sleep. Uh, yes. Which is another strange thing. And I had a interesting experience that night where I'm curled up in a moon chair, and the... And it, it, it's weird to describe because at a certain point, the lines between being awake and being asleep get very blurry. And anyways, I'm curled up in this moon chair, and I can see into the next room. It was kind of a parlor area, and there was a room off the side of that. And at one point, I'm looking into the, the parlor room, and it just starts like shaking. Like one of those, uh, like the Cloverfield movie, where it's like a mockumentary, but it's a bad one. So it's like <laughs> the person has like some sort of condition where they've got the hand tremors and 
then this thing crawls out of that side room and it starts coming towards me and it's just about to where I'm sleeping and I wake up and I hadn't even realized I'd fallen asleep and I've had a few experiences like that um and yeah very like the the visual while I'm awake has been the most recent um I was actually interacting with Kelly at Shaler with some guy that I was actually able to kind of see um and that was the weirdest thing because for anybody who's listened to me you know that I can't see anything so we're both interacting with a spirit and I can see him and I can feel him and he can see him so it's like he was it was weird. Anyway, sorry. It's a it's a fun little yin yang thing when Kelly and I are together because yeah. she'll hear them and it's frustrating. Cause she's like sitting here having this fun little conversation, like what the fuck are you saying? But I'm guessing where they're at too. He knows exactly where they're at. I'm guessing they could sneak up on me and do bad things. <laughs> or we just did. Uh, so we just did Melbourne and we were in Gracie's room. It was me, Cynthia, and a couple other people. I think my old pal was in there and. Uh, we're sitting there, and we're trying to talk, and no sooner than Cynthia acknowledges, like, oh, Gracie's here, I start seeing this figure pacing back and forth in the room, kind of behind where Pat was sitting, just along the wall. And then Cynthia, being a loving, caring individual, she, she's like, well, you like boys, come sit on Chris's lap. <laughs> <laughs> She's and, so helpful. And Gracie actually comes around, and she didn't sit on my lap, thank God, but she, like, hung out right between me and Cynthia and Cynthia knew she was there and I was very aware of the fact she was there. Um, so that's, that's been that and I'm very curious to see how this progresses. Well, yeah, you're, you're definitely working more on the woo-woo side of things and growing things, so it'll be interesting. My woo-woo is growing. Your woo-woo is growing. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be on a t-shirt. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> we should come up with amazing woo woo sayings for t shirts. Oh, we're on this. This is going to happen. <laughs> All right. Um, so there was a question that popped up and it got deleted, but I liked it. So I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, what are your views on haunted objects and what would you do if you ever came across one? Um, so I'm not. 100%. So when a, when you think haunted object, you think like Annabelle, and it's this thing strictly attached to this object, and you know, maybe for the extremely negative things like demons, that that, that could be a, a factor somehow, but my, my thing is once you die, I'm assuming free will is still a thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anywhere or anyone in particular is haunted. I think a spirit's just choosing to stick around something. So if it's the haunt, like a haunted house that you know could have been a house they lived in, that's just somewhere that's very comfortable to them. So it makes sense that they kind of stuck around that house. Well, I'm sitting here with my whiskey glass, and this is my whiskey glass, and I love it. He does and this kinda. is mine, and... When I die, I'm going to stick around this glass. Wherever it goes, I'm going to go just because I love that glass so much. That That's still an elective choice. That doesn't mean the, the glass this piece of glass itself. is haunted. But, you know, maybe somebody's just very prone to sticking around it, if that makes sense. It makes sense to me, and I guess that's kind of my thoughts, too. It's, yeah, that you may be drawn to that object, but the object itself is not haunted. If the spirit goes away from it, the object becomes an object again. Yeah, and because, I mean, I'm, I obviously wouldn't stick around this glass all the time. Because eventually it'd be empty, and then... Well, there's no fun in that you anymore. you lose your <laughs> interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alright, so... One other question. Um... Who is the person or group person or group you want to investigate with that you have not yet? That was a big sigh. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. So when it comes to the paranormal stuff, I don't I don't know. I, I honestly I want to investigate with everybody. Just because I feel like everybody's got this kind of different piece to the puzzle. And to see other people's interactions and perspectives, it's uh, it's something I want a little bit of everybody. 
Um, I had got a similar question on a previous podcast, and honestly, it's going to sound weird right off the top, but I would love to do an investigation with someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, like the astrophysicist, because that is a solid, 100% scientific mindset, and to see, like, in in the role of, like, looking into a pseudoscience, I feel like that would be just kind of a fun investigation to do. On top of the fact, he just seems like a genuinely cool guy. So, I want to investigate with everybody, but if it's somebody who's not an investigator, if Neil deGrasse Tyson is listening and is wanting to do some stuff, that's my answer. You are such a weird man. I am. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Okay, then. Darren agrees. All right. We need to make this happen. Um, I don't know who to get in touch with about this. Probably this him happen. would be my guess. We're going to do this. Okay, sure. Um, we'll reach out to him see what we can figure out. Somebody forward this to him. Somebody knows somebody who knows him. We can figure this out, I'm sure. Right? All right. What else do we have here? Um, so we're getting, getting towards the end of this, guys. If you guys have any questions you want to ask Chris, let me know here real quick. Um, what, when you go out on an investigation, what is your favorite way to investigate and, or what are your favorite tools, instruments to use? Back to the hard hitting questions. You know, Um, I gotta throw some of these, I have to pretend I'm a normal podcast host on occasion. Okay. Honestly, I, I don't have any particular favorite. It's. When I do investigations, it's a very organic process. Um, So I will use tools to investigate where people are saying they're hearing more things. I'll use more audio-based stuff. Uh, So like the recorders, the ITC devices. Um, If people are seeing more things, I'm more prone to breaking out a camera. Uh, If it's like a a public event, like spook game events, I will typically have like the EMF meters up so that they can see them visually spike or an ITC device where they're getting those, like, immediate kind of interactions because, uh, you know, it's not a public event without that instant gratification to it. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if there is a particular favorite. Uh, lately, honestly, my thing's been going out and using my woo-woo. <laughs> that it is. <laughs> oh, no, it really has. It's been an interesting experience. Uh-huh. I've been... I don't know if it's you know, possible to you know, per se get better at it, yeah, but I really, I, I really feel like I have been. So that's been kind of the direction I've been going lately. I've been still using the tools and toys and stuff, but uh, no, that the, what you did at Shaler. I mean, that was absolute growth. Like growth. I've never seen you do anything like that before. That was crazy and cool all at the same time. So. Yeah, I mean, the more that you use it and the more that you allow yourself to open up to have those experiences, it's going to keep happening, and it'll get easier, and, yeah. (laughs) All right. Um, So, yeah, we're going to, what device, what device would you be afraid to try? My actual woo-woo. I don't know if there's anything to be afraid to try. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god, we're gonna. I don't know if there's anything I'd actually be afraid to try. I've always had this (laughs) preconceived phobia of the Ouija board. Um, Honestly, I don't. uh, my, My perspective recently on that has very much changed. Um, so I feel like if I were to go into apprehension with anything, it would be that, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't know if there's anything I'd actually be afraid to try using. (laughs) My brain goes bad places. Anyways. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, so Yeah. (laughs) All right, so I'm going to start um, shuffling cards. So like I usually do at the end of a show, 
I'll do a one card reading, just kind of a general reading for everybody. Um, well, I'll let Chris answer that question. How about a Jacob's Ladder? Does that actually? Does that stop actually talking about the one in the actual woo -woo. <laughs> Stop setting me up. Um, no, so Jacob's Ladder. I, does it work? I mean, it makes sense. Like, if a spirit's going to use an excess in electronic energy in the air to, you know, either manipulate the actual, you know, is it like a rung, so to speak, of electricity, or to use that energy itself to manifest? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. It's a thing. I wouldn't be personally afraid of using it. My big thing is actually so back when people were developing those EMF pumps. Uh, notice those aren't seen a lot anymore, and that's because they were getting EVPs of spirits saying it burns, it hurts, yeah. it's too yeah. much. Yeah. So I don't think I would use a Jacob's Ladder for... I mean, I would use it, but I'd, like, I wouldn't because I know it's not going to be good for them. Um, it's kind of like taking dogs onto investigation. Yes, dogs are able to pick up and sense different things than people, but I would never take my dog on investigation because there's adverse effects that could happen, you know, to my dog that, you know, she wouldn't necessarily be able to communicate to me. So would I use it? Yeah, but that's just me personally. Would I actually do it? Probably not because I'm not the only one involved in the process. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do this one card reading, and then we'll come back to you and give you a chance to say where everybody can find you, um, see what you got coming up in the future. Um, so tonight for the one card reading, um, just to keep going on that, so Mama Pat was asking, what's a Jacob's Ladder as it pertains to investigating? Don't answer the other way. <laughs> um, if that doesn't help, Mom, she only knows it as a toy. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> control yourself, Dan. That's my mother! <laughs> <laughs> so, a Jacob's Ladder for Investigations, uh, it's basically taking a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, um, so you plug it in, and it's basically got these two copper prongs that go out, and there's not a complete circuit into it, it's, you plug it in, it's the circuit box there, the two prongs go out, and there's this actual bar of electricity that travels between the two prongs to the top until it's just naturally released into the air. Um, it's like the Frankenstein thing that looks like a V and it goes zip, zip. You just described it far better than I ever could. Yeah. I don't know if that helps, but for us non-techy people, that's what it is. All right. So now back to the card while we're focusing and not thinking about my mother's and Jacob, my mother and Jacob's ladders. Um, you're welcome. Whiskey came out my nose. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> Read the card. All right. <laughs> yeah, Bob, you're not helping. Just. <laughs> okay. Phew. I'm going to read a card. We're going to get all serious here for a minute. Oh, I'm sweating, mother. Um, <laughs> um, so tonight I am drawing a card out of the Earth Magic Oracle deck. And obviously this card is for my mother because it's the innocence card. Whew. Okay. Uh. <laughs> All right. So this card, it's a general reading, guys. Um, it may pertain to some of you guys. It may not pertain to everybody. That's okay. Take from this what you will. Um, if it doesn't make sense to you, it wasn't meant for you, and hopefully a different night will. So this card, the Innocence card, it says, Innocence is not simply the lack of guilt or shame, but a quality in itself, one that you naturally possess when you first come into this existence. There are challenges you have faced throughout life that have further shaped your personality and character. 
You have also likely encountered moments following a disappointment or loss where you turned sour or cynical and no doubt have had times when layers of anger or fear blocked the flow of your vitality, your life force. Yet in spite of all this, there is a core of innocence that you can reawaken by releasing any shame that has covered over the truth of who you are. Take any opportunity to heal this shame and let it go so you can revisit that state of purity. Doing so helps you see every movement with fresh eyes and removes the filters that inhibit your light and love from coming forth. You truly are a child of God, so allow yourself to be that. So basically what this card is saying to me, guys, is a lot of times... um, (laughs) Sorry, I'm reading chat again. I got distracted by my mother and perverts. Um, So a lot of times, guys, we... Society tells people what they're supposed to be, what they are, what they're not, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to behave, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And we hide who we are a lot of times, you know, Um, and I I know this personally. I spent a lot of years hiding who I was, a a big part of me hiding my woo-woo because I didn't want to be seen as that type of a person, you know, Um But it doesn't always have to be something that big. It can simply be that um, it may be a situation that's come up in your life that things are going in a direction that maybe people don't always see as the way things should happen. And maybe maybe not everybody is going to understand how how things progressed. Or maybe you're in a situation where you're worried what other people are going to think about you, but you really have to just kind of embrace who you are. You have to be true to yourself and you have to really think, am I doing the best thing? Am I being true to who I am? Because hiding yourself does nobody any good. It, it's not going to do any good for them. It's not going to do any good for you. And eventually that truth is going to come out. If that truth doesn't come out, then you're just, you're going to not be a happy person. I I hid who I was for a lot of years. I hid what I could do, and, you know, it it did. It led to some pretty serious depression for me, and it was when I finally decided that I wasn't going to hide that anymore that I started understanding who I was, and I found that happiness. Does that mean that you're always going to be happy, that you're never going to have those low moments? No, you're still going to have them, absolutely, but sometimes you have to just say, screw what everybody else thinks and embrace that happiness, and... And roll with it because nobody has a right to tell you when you should or should not be happy. Nobody has a right to tell you that something is or is not right. That's you. You're the only person who gets to make that decision. So if other people can't understand that, and I actually said these words to someone today, if somebody can't understand where you're coming from and isn't even trying to understand it, fuck them. They, you don't need them. So, And I know that sounds really harsh, but oh my God. It gets so much better when you just stop caring what everybody else thinks all the time. So there's my little soapbox for you. How you guys like that one? All right. Christopher. That's me. What do you got coming up? What do I got coming up? What's fun and exciting? Where are we going to see it in the future? <sighs> Immediately. I think I've got a couple weeks off. What? I know, right? Weekends off? No way. Um, aside from that, I mean, I've got a couple uh, small things here and there between now and 2020, but uh, come 2020, it's going to gonna be a little bit everywhere. I'm going uh, to be at HauntCon in, uh, in Omaha. Just found out today you're going to be able to find me at the Michigan Paracon. Uh, I'm going to be at Gettysburg at some point. I'm looking forward to hosting a few more events. Uh, I think. Trying to think what else. Uh, hopefully, Spook Cave. Fingers crossed for that. Oh, yeah. Um, but aside from that, uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere on social media under the handle at the Paranomad or at www.theparanomad.com. And uh, 2020 is actually going to be kind of my, bit, hopefully, that my big year for that. So I spent 2019 kind of getting a little bit of a 
base audience underneath of me. And then 2020 is going to be the year where um, the con- I'm just going to spew content all over everybody. So the uh, website's not only going to be updates on what I'm doing on investigations, it's also going to be like pretty much your paranormal one-stop shop for anything. I'm working on articles on paranormal theory, the equipment, locations, location, like investigations, uh, some of my personal stories, that sort of thing. And the YouTube channel is going to be pretty similar for that. Um, on top of that, you know, pretty much keeping up with wherever you're going to find me in person, too. So if Spook Cape 2020 does happen, uh, that'll be all over the website, social media, oh, yeah. um, any events coming up, cool people I meet, fun things I'm doing. Uh, yeah, I think that's my shameless plug. All right, then. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me think. What do we got coming out? Um, so we just got done with the Quad City Psychic and Paranormal Expo last weekend. So everybody who helped promote that or came out to that, I just want to say a quick thank you. Um, Mama Pat and I have been hosting those expos for eight years. And so this was the end of our eighth year of hosting those. And um, just wanted to give a huge shout out to everybody uh, that, you know, the support of our vendors and the support of the attendees. It means the world to us. I know Mama Pat and I talk about that all the time. Um, that this we we have got to where we're at right now because of the people that support us. So, absolutely amazing. Thank you to everybody who has supported that in any way, shape, or form. We appreciate it. Um, so coming up for me, um, yeah, I actually have a couple of weekends off too. It's kind of weird. Um, I don't know what to do with myself because I haven't had any weekends off since, like, April, I think. Something like that. Um, but what that means, guys, since I'm not running around all over the country all the frickin' time, Miss Shay is stuck with me again on Fridays. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, so I will be on Shay's Paranormal Chat this Friday with Shay when our special guest is the one and the only Dan Class. He's a hoot and a holler. You guys do not want to miss that one because, oh, my Lord, he's a pain in my hiney, but he's a good time. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Dan Class is our guest on Friday. And then next week on the Realm Walker, I am going to have um, Shannon Weber as my guest. And she is actually a Wiccan High Priestess. So she is going to be coming on and sharing a bunch of information about... Wicca and what it truly is, what they do, um, just really kind of enlightening us on all of that. Because I think sometimes the reason that I wanted to bring her on the show is I think sometimes that people get the wrong impression on what it is and what they do. And she is truly one of the best people that I know. So I'm, I'm so excited to have her on the show. And it will actually be a um, precursor to my next intuitive journey class where she will be coming and actually hosting a Wiccan ritual for us. So i um, super excited about that. Uh, let me see what else we have coming up. Um, after that, I'm not sure what my shows are going to be with the holidays in there. Shay and I are going to talk about a schedule because, you know, I'm kind of a pain in the butt. But, um, and can I just say one more time, a huge thank you to Shay because Keeping track of everybody has got to be a nightmare, and doing everything that she does has got to be, it is a full-time job. It absolutely is a full-time job, and it's probably not one that pays, it doesn't pay well at all, but it doesn't necessarily get the appreciation that it should. But anybody who has to keep track of me, holy shit, they deserve, like, medals and drinks and lots of good stuff. So a huge, huge thank you to my Shay because she puts up with my shit. She keeps me in line. She keeps me. In, she reaches out and says, "I haven't got your crap yet." Somebody has to do that. So I appreciate her, and she's blushing and shaking her head at me, and she hates me right now. I wish you guys could see her face because she hates me so much right now. It's amazing. Love you, Shay. <laughs> All right. Um. Yeah. So a few investigations coming up. Um. I'll share those as I can closer to the date. But yeah, like, kind of like Chris was saying for 2020, a lot of cool things coming up, a lot of traveling. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited, guys. So, Stop. okay, that can't be thunder. I thought there was thunder outside my house. It was craziness. All right. So, oh, I'm going to 
Um, sorry. I just saw something that distracted me. All right, guys. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys putting up with my sporadic schedule and my craziness. And um, at least for a couple months, we will not have to play Where in the World is Kelly because you're going to be stuck with me. Was that thunder, Mom? Seriously, that's crazy. Oh, my gosh. It was really loud. Okay. Well, Mama Pat across town said what I just heard was thunder. So, um. Yes, Billy and Re, uh, traveling, traveling out towards the East Coast, but I'm going to be further north than you, so we may have to make some arrangements for you to come north and see me. Um, yeah, all right. Love you guys. Um, hope you guys had a good time. Christopher, thank you. I had a you. fantastic time. Thank you. Thanks for being my guest. I'm sure you guys will hear more from Chris. We'll have him back on the show because we have fun. So... Uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, for everybody in chat, I'm not going to go back and do shout outs because, because, but I see you. I appreciate you. Love you guys. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. If you guys are listening to this on a playback, thank you so much. Be sure to hit the like button, show some love, keep Shay going. Um, keeps my show going so Shay doesn't fire me because I am always in danger of being fired. Um, yeah. Love you guys so much. We'll talk to you guys Friday night with Shay and next week on The Realm Walker. Have a good night.